Well, good morning, Bethel Church. Thank you for having me here this morning. Those of you joining us online, uh, may God be with you as well as you worship from home or wherever it is that, that you're joining us. We're excited today to, to talk about uh, the source of joy. And you know, you know as well as I do, that a lot of times in life, there are just things that want to take our joy from us. But you know, when you think about it, as believers, we should be the most joyful, happy people on the planet. Because we have eternal life. We have a hope that is so sure, so incredible, so amazing, so present in whatever it is that we face. It is always possible to be joyful even in the midst of some of the painful things that life throws at us. And there are many, and some of them are big. The pain that it causes, the broken relationships, physical ailments, uh, financial trouble, trouble with uh, other relationships and strife, you know, at work or, or with friends, or different things that happen, losses that happen, they, they come and, and, and they come against us and try to wound our soul and drag us down and fill us with negativity and fill us with anger, fill us with anxiety and depression. It, it, it hits us and it can be difficult. But when we really stop and think about the reality that even today when we woke up, we woke up one day closer to when Jesus comes. This is good news. And so today I want to talk a little bit about how to switch our mindset into a mindset of joyfulness and thankfulness. So let me open with some prayer and pray for us. And as I do that, I, I invite you to think of a situation right now that you might be facing, that you're up against, that is trying to steal your joy. And let's hold that up to the Father. And let's pray together as a body of Christ, as a family. So God, right now, thank you for how amazing you are. Thank you that you are God. Thank you that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that at your name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory. Thank you that whatever it is that we are facing, these situations, God, that we are even bringing to our minds right now, God, we hold these up to you. Would you give us victory in this area? Would you give us peace? Would you give us breakthrough? God, wherever the enemy has or wants to or is trying to invade minds and bodies and relationships of your children, right now, in Jesus' name, we command you to move off this situation. God, I speak peace to anxious, troubled minds. I speak peace peace and joy into homes and relationships. I speak restoration and forgiveness in the mighty name of Jesus where there is strife. Father, would you release your healing ointment on anyone who has any physical sickness? May you heal bodies right now, organs, systems, nerves, skin, cells, whatever area right now needs healing, would you release that? We speak life over physical bodies right now, right where we are, in Jesus' name. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw close to us. We set our minds and our hearts on you today, and we look to you, Father. Come and speak to us, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you right where you are. So listen to this. Here, here's, here is something I was, I was reading recently. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. 
sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Sounds like social media nowadays. Sounds like the world. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Right there, the Bible tells us, Paul writes that we live by the Spirit. So we need the Holy Spirit just to, to function in our lives, to live a life of, of victory and breakthrough and, and to live this life of promise that God has given us. We live by the Holy Spirit. When we become believers, we receive the Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance to come. But he also encourages us to keep in step with the Spirit. So there is some action in the way that we live with the Holy Spirit. We also have to keep in step. Now, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I'm not very disciplined. So when it comes to, to prayer and spending time in the Word, I have to create structure and be intentional about it. That's one of the ways that I find I keep in step with the Spirit. And the more I'm drawing close to God and experiencing His presence, carving out time to be in prayer, pouring out my heart, worshiping Him, declaring Him over whatever it is that I'm facing, spending time in His presence, fellowshipping with Him, spending time in the Word, I find that, that I, I get filled more and more with the Holy Spirit. I feel His presence more. I draw near to him. And the, I love this promise. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. So as we draw near, he draws near, and we get filled with the Spirit. And in our lives, all those negative things, the idolatry, the witchcraft, the hatred, discord, sexual immorality, all those other things that are talked about, those get pushed out. And love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control begin to manifest. It begins to be the way I respond to things, the way I move, the, the experience people have in my presence. They feel those things. And I begin to exemplify Christ to this world. And joy is all a part of that. I mean, when you think about it, if you really stop and think about this one thing today, we as believers are going to be in heaven. Now, I, I know a lot of times we see in movies, we see people, uh, you know, try to uh, imagine heaven, and uh, I think there's even a, a commercial out there for cream cheese or something. You know, and it just looks like we get these white robes and we just sit on clouds and we, we get a harp and we get to sing Kumbaya forever. And I've, I've, even heard, I've even heard people tell me, yeah, man, sometimes when I think about heaven, I'm worried that it's going to be boring. I'm like, how, how could that possibly be? If you think about it, we're going to get to see God in all of his glory, all of his awesomeness on full display. We're going to see him as he is with our own eyes, joining in with millions upon millions of angels and 
millions and millions and millions of people who have existed throughout history from the Garden of Eden through all the Old Testament and and 2,000 years of church history and those who are yet to be born to come to know him, we're all going to be together in this awesome, massive family seeing God, our sinful nature and shame will be completely stripped away. There will be no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. Every tear will be wiped away. And we will be with him, worshiping him, fellowshipping with each other, fellowshipping with him in the fullness of his glory that will be revealed in us as we take our seats and reign with Christ forever. It's never going to end. This is an incredible source of joy. It's why the Bible says rejoice in all things. Again, I'll say rejoice. We can rejoice, my brothers and sisters. We can rejoice when we think about the great promise that he has given us. And nothing, no circumstances in life can take away that promise. It's ours. And it's sure. I can't wait to go into glory. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful to be alive. I'm thankful for every day I get to wake up and, and, and serve him. I know there is a lot of work to be done yet. But man, I'm telling you, there is something better coming. It's like what my grandma used to say after a meal, keep your fork. You know, because there was dessert. I always had a big cake. You know, this life, keep your fork, guys. There's something great coming. And we get to not only experience it one day, we get to experience a lot of that today. Not perfectly, because we still live in a fallen world, but we have his promise guaranteeing this inheritance. We get to experience his presence. We get to fellowship with him. We get to live by the spirit and keep in step with the spirit. We get to go into God's presence and access it. Now we do it by faith. Then we will do it by sight. What a joy. You know, when you think about a a baby in the womb, I, I learned that at about seven months, a baby in the womb begins to interact with the outside world, outside of its mother's body. It begins to recognize voices. It begins to sense pressure if if it's being pushed on. It begins to sense what its mother is feeling, whether anxious or happy or at peace. It, It begins to interact with its outside world. But think about it, as much as it's learning and processing these things, what does a baby outside the womb really know about the world? About colors and sunsets and and space and mathematics and science and, and history and all those things. A baby knows nothing. It can only only perceive a very few things. And sometimes I think that's what we truly grasp about heaven. We're in the womb right now. We have all these great promises in scripture, but we're like a baby inside the womb. But then a baby is born and it, and it interacts All of a sudden, it's like it can see and there's light and there's people and faces and and colors and, and sensations. And I feel like when we actually pass from this life, it's actually like being born. And I'm sure we know about as much of the the great glory that we're going to experience as a baby knows inside the womb. I love the way God summed up this promise. He said, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it even entered the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. That's God's way of saying, you you can't even imagine. I haven't even shown anyone. It's going to blow our minds. And that's what our God would be like, wouldn't he? 
Just a great big surprise party. He says he's going away and he's going to, in his father's house are many rooms, but he's going to come back and take us to be with him. He's, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. You know, I don't know if you've ever watched that show, Extreme Makeover, Home Edition. But at the end of the show, there's always that move that bus, and the bus moves out of the way, and this family sees this place that's been prepared. It's always very personal. Each of the rooms for the children has been designed with their interests and and their personalities and very, very personally designed and upgraded. They get, oh my goodness, oh, they, they cry and they hug and they can't believe. You know, I believe and I know that Jesus has a move that bus moment for every single one of us in his kingdom. That there in that place, we will see that he has designed it and created this incredible place for us to just be his kids to be in his family, to be near him and to reign with him. And who knows what he has planned next. I often think of it this way. I often think of it as God, you know, after, after he comes back and it says that, you know, he destroys the, the old heaven and the old earth, and he recreates a new heaven and a new earth. And this, in, in the book of Revelation, there's the, this capital city, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. I mean, first of all, it's a city that can fly. <laughs> and it lands, and, and, and there people can enter, and there's a, a marriage feast of the Lamb, this, this big celebration where we sit down, and then we have no idea what it just says, and, and then we'll reign with him forever. Like, we have no idea. I, I picture God at the end of that celebration saying, okay, guys, that was chapter one. All of history, everything, all of creation, the angels, the demons, the wars, the kingdoms that came and went, the prophets, everything, all of Jesus coming, dying on the cross, rising again, building his church, all this. He's like, guys, that was chapter one. Are you ready for chapter two? And he just like opens it up. And he's like, oh, by the way, there's 50 chapters. <laughs> oh, and that's just the first book. There's 50 books. Oh, and, and that's just the first series. There's 50 series that I have prepared. Oh, and, and, and that's just on one shelf. There's actually 50 shelves. And that's just that one bookcase. There's 50 bookcases. <laughs> and that's just that one library. There's 50 libraries. And that's just in one city. There's 50 cities. And each one has, like, just, can you understand how continuous and how glorious his plans must be? And we have all of eternity to get to know and love and worship an eternal God. I, I picture, you know, it talks about the, the, the elders who continuously, night and day, cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and is to come. You know, and they worship him and, and, and it says, and they, 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 they fall down and they, they worship him. And I, I, I picture what happens is that, that they see God and they're like, oh, wow, he's so amazing. And they worship and they fall down and they just can't help but worship. And then they get up again and they look and oh, he's even better than before. And they worship and that's why it's day and night. They just, oh, he's even better. How incredible it is that we have this God to love, to serve, to worship, and to honor. Guys, this should be a source of joy. I want to I encourage you, as, as I am learning as well, especially during this pandemic. It, it took me a while, but, but I love this. Therefore, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. If you want to see that love, if you want to see that joy, that 
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you want to see that and see joy coming out, keep in step with the Spirit. I encourage you to really intentionally be carving out time to be alone with your king. Create time to be with him. Don't find time. Make time. This is a challenge for me too. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm receiving this word as well as sharing it with you. But let's do that. Let us keep in step with the Spirit, church. Let's make time to be alone with him. Just like Jesus said. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites standing up on street corners and, you know, going to all these prayer meetings, which are, which are great. Do that. Absolutely. Pray with other believers and stuff. Say grace at meals. That, that's all good, too. But for many of us, that's about all we do pray. And I want to challenge us as a church. Let's get into God's presence, into God's word. I heard a quote the other day when he was asked, what's more important, prayer or reading the Bible? <laughs> and this pastor responded, what's more important, breathing in or breathing out? <laughs> Let's learn to breathe in the spiritual realms. Breathe in God's presence, breathe in God's word, breathe out prayer, Breathe out worship, breathe in again, breathe out again. This is our life. Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites standing on the street. He said, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who sees what is done in secret, and he will reward you. I love that it comes with a promise, and he will reward you. Now, that's not necessarily that he's, you know, we that reward is often just his presence, but it's often the, all the breakthroughs. It's, it's the, the source of victory. It's where the, the answers begin to, to pour in to the problems and the challenges that you're up against and facing. That's where you actually start to see changes that you want to see. In fact, I've, I've heard this, and I think I might have even mentioned it uh, in a previous message, but the, the real work we do for God is first in prayer. And then the service we do from there is just gathering the results. So you want to see God breaking through in your life and in your situation and in relationships or whatever challenges it is that, that, that you're up against? Get into his presence and fight. Fight for it. Worship, declare scriptures over things, command spirits to go and move off of things, speak to the sickness, and tell it to go in Jesus' name. Stand in his presence and worship with him. Remind him of his promises and stand in his word. And you guys, I guarantee as you begin to worship him and see him, He's going to reveal, he's going to draw close to you, he's going to reward you with his presence and you're going to draw close and it's going to stir up a hunger and a desire for more and more. And maybe right now your, your hunger level is like a little shot glass size. But as that gets filled up, all of a sudden the longing for his presence turns into a cup. And then from a cup to a bucket, and from a bucket to a barrel, and from a barrel to a big vat. And it increases as we draw near to him, he begins to draw near to us. And there is a life that flows into us that you do not have in your flesh. Let me say that again. Hunger and desire for God doesn't exist in you naturally in your flesh. Our flesh does not desire what the Holy Spirit wants. We're naturally drawn to the darkness, to run from God, to flee, to be in control, to replace it with anything that, that temporarily fulfills. We need the Holy Spirit to draw us into his presence and create that longing 
And the best way is by keeping in step with the Spirit, walking with Him every day, learning to turn our thoughts and attention and devotion to God. Get into His Word. Get into His presence. You're going to see His joy. And as that joy begins to mix, and, and these affect our emotions and our mental health, like love, joy, peace, those three alone would be nice to have, amen? It's deeper than just emotion, but it also includes our emotions. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So I pray that you're encouraged today. I, I know in this pandemic, our schedules have been thrown off and a lot of us, you know, our routines have changed and not all of it has gone really well. There's been some tough things to accept. There's been a lot of anxiety. There's been strife. You guys, it's, let's take some time even today to just get out from under it, get into God's presence, get down on our knees. And if you have to humble yourself and confess some things, then go to your Father who is willing. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to seek and save the lost. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The law of the spirit of life has set you free. So don't go in a spirit of, of condemnation. Go in an openness. Humble yourself before him. Ask him to fill you anew with the spirit. And then let's learn to keep in step with that spirit. And if it's been a while since you've opened up <clears throat> your Bible, start doing a chapter a day. Just pick a book. I recommend Galatians. I'm really enjoying it right now. But anywhere. Just start getting into God's word and you will encounter him and go again and then go again and go again and again and again until you get into that relationship with him that you're wanting to, to see bring forth fruit. Amen? And as you do, I want to I want to share this with you. This is something that I wrote a number of years ago when I was speaking on a youth retreat. And I, I just want to encourage you with it, you know, just to, to inspire uh, your worship as, as, it, as it did mine. Uh, I woke up in the, it was really in the middle of the night and I just felt God speaking to me. Uh, this one night and so I just started I just started typing this out and and what I started to understand is how good God is and how he has shown us in every single book of the Bible something special and unique about who he is and so I put this together I just want to read it out to you in Genesis, he is the almighty, all-powerful creator whose mere word can create entire worlds and galaxies and who sets the stars on fire and begins to unfold his redemption story. In Exodus, he is the unstoppable and conquering deliverer who can rescue out of the darkest pits. In Leviticus, he is the powerful ruler who establishes justice and whose laws are good, right, and fair. In Numbers, he is the God who knows people by name, where they live, who their families are. He is the God who is involved. In Deuteronomy, he is the God who delights in covenant, who will never break his word and looks after all who are committed to him. He is the God who desires to bless and not curse. In Joshua, he is the God of promise, who empowers his people to take down their enemies in a single shout, who desires to prosper his people and lead them to peace and safety. In Judges, he is the God who leads his people out of oppression and delivers them when things look hopeless. In Ruth, he is the redeemer. He grants nobility to those who follow him and he is selfless and unwavering in his devotion and is loyal. In First and Second Samuel, he is a mighty king with power and authority. His rule will never end and he's 
He alone reigns over all. He slays giants, and he is the one who makes a leader great. In First and Second Kings, he is a faithful prince, building his kingdom, and whose prophecies come true 100% of the time. In First and Second Chronicles, he is the God who restores hope after failure and returns his promise to those who call out to him. In Ezra and Nehemiah, he is the God who builds back up what has been torn down. He cancels debts and starts things fresh and offers a clean slate. In Esther, he is the God who controls coincidence and who uses small people who feel insignificant to change history. He is a God who values women and holds a special place for them in his plans. In Job, he is the God who speaks in the storm, whose peace stills all confusion. In Psalms, he is the God of all glory, whose praise cannot be contained, whose songs will never cease, and who rules over every nation. In Proverbs, he is the all-wise God, whose wisdom knows no end. In Ecclesiastes, he is the God of purpose. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, he is the reason for living, and without him, everything is meaningless. In Song of Psalms, he is the passionate lover who chases the objects of his affection. His heart pounds for the ones he loves, and he stops at nothing to get to them. He loves extravagantly, and he loves recklessly. In Isaiah, he is the God of salvation. He saves. In Jeremiah, he is the God who disciplines the unfaithful, judges those who have no regard for him, yet calls out for them to come to him for forgiveness. In Lamentations, he is the God whose heart can be broken who is grieved by rebellion and who hates the oppression of others. He is swift to call them to account, yet is merciful to any who call on his name. In Ezekiel, he is the God who directs the course of history. In Daniel, he is the God who shuts the mouth of the lion. In Hosea, he is the husband who will chase his bride, no matter how unfaithful she has been. In Joel, he is the God who thunders at the head of his army. In Amos, he is the God of the poor and broken. In Obadiah, he is the God who always triumphs. In Jonah, he is the God on an unstoppable mission. In Micah, he is the God who gives hope to the hopeless. In Nahum, he is the God who holds the future. In Habakkuk, he is the God who can handle doubt and doesn't mind our questions. In Zephaniah, he is the God who can split the heavens when he comes to judge the whole earth. In Haggai, he is the God who strengthens and gives power to those who follow him. In Zechariah, he is the God who encourages. In Malachi, he is a consuming fire. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is the very word of God in human flesh in his son Jesus. He is the kingdom come. He is the crucified king, buried, who comes back from death, defeating sin, Satan, and death itself. He is the author of a new covenant, and behold, he makes all things new. In Acts, he is the mighty missionary going throughout the earth. In Romans, he is the God who desires to save. In First and Second Corinthians, he is the great shepherd. In Galatians, he is the God who sets free from dead religion. In Ephesians, he is the God who breaks down all barriers between race, age, man and woman, social status, and is the God of family. In Philippians, he is the God who strengthens the persecuted. In Colossians, he is the creator, the sustainer, and the center of all things. In First and Second Thessalonians, Thessalonians, he is the God who is coming back. In First and Second Timothy, he is a father to those he is dis- discipling and cares for his children. In Titus, he is a God and is a faithful and capable leader. In Philemon, he sets slaves free. In Hebrews, he is the commander of angels, the author and finisher of our faith, and is superior to all. In James, he is the giver of wisdom to anyone who asks. In First and Second Peter, he is the God who brings strength to those who suffer. In First, Second, and Third John, he is the God who walks in love. In Jude, he is the God of integrity. And in Revelation, he is the first and he is the last. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the holder of the key of David. He is the coming king who will create a new heaven and a new earth and will wipe away every tear from every eye and reign forever with his chosen ones. He will end all dying, all mourning, all crying, and all pain, and his kingdom will never end, and neither will the joy of all who follow him. That's our king. That's our God. He is worthy of our worship. And as we live by his spirit and keep in step with his spirit, 
I pray that these fruit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control will begin to just flood out of you and into this broken world that so desperately needs us to be like that. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that this is who you are. Thank you for opening up the doors of heaven and inviting us to come in, to be at your table, to sit with you, to dine with you, to fellowship with you. And not just now, but for all eternity. Thank you that you died on the cross for this great gift. And I pray right now you would touch every single person listening right now with a fresh, new joy, a fresh new desire and hunger to be in your presence. Bless us right where we are, whatever we're facing. We thank you, we trust you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.